Hey, let's go ahead and make sure we're welcoming everybody online too. Clap your hands real loud for everybody online. Every neighborhood gathering, every single home gathering. We love you, North family. We love you so very much. Antigua, Guatemala. We got beautiful friends and family all over the world, folks in the room. And I, I love that we have the opportunity to be together. I'm believing that God is going to push every one of us forward. Today, we're beginning a brand new series, a brand new series of messages right now. It's four parts, and it is titled, What Lies Beneath? What Lies Beneath? Uh, I, I am really excited about this because I think God is going to push every single one of us forward. Each of these um, messages, talks, sermons, whatever, are going to be a critical piece to your spiritual development. They're going to help you and I become uh, and understand even more who God has designed for us to be. And I'm praying that it impacts how you and I interact with each other, interact, uh, impacts how we interact in the world around us. I think God is wanting to do something significant. Now, here's, here's one of the first principles about this series. I want to make sure you, you jot down if you're taking notes. I'm going to put it on the screen for you as well. It's this point. What you can't see stabilizes or sabotages what you can see. What you can't see stabilizes or sabotages what you can see. Have you ever, uh, you see a, a marriage, my wife and I just did this little relationship, you know, series, and uh, some of you have been so kind uh, to talk about, oh man, I hope I have a marriage like yours one day, and uh, I mean, I, I love being married, my wife and I love it, but, but the reality is what you, what you can see, it's either going to be built up, going to be made stronger, or it's going to be sabotaged by the things that you can't see, meaning if you have secrets in your marriage that your spouse does not know about, those secrets, those things that lie beneath the surface will be the thing that make your marriage strong or we know your marriage is headed towards hell and you don't even know it yet. You look at a business and you can say, oh my goodness, look at that business. It's looking amazing. It's wonderful. It's the stuff that you can't see. It's the stuff underneath the surface that will determine whether or not that, that business is going to be stable or it's going to self-sabotage in the future. Any relationship you see, don't, don't get so enamored with the stuff that you see. You want to try to dig into the stuff that you can't see because sometimes you might begin to mimic somebody and you're trying to mimic the stuff that you can see and you don't get the same result because you're not doing the stuff that you can't see. If you're not willing to wash feet and serve and forgive, but you want a marriage like my wife and I have, then I'm telling you, you can't get the marriage that we have if you're not willing to forgive. It's the stuff that you can't see. If you see someone with a business that's taken off, an entrepreneur that's doing so amazing, but you're not okay waking up early and staying up late and putting in your own money, I'm telling you, it's the stuff that you can't see is, are the things that will stabilize or strengthen or sabotage the things that you can see. What lies beneath? What lies beneath in your spiritual life? What lies beneath in your financial life? What lies beneath in your mental life? These are the things that are critical to you and I moving forward and becoming all that God has called us to be. So uh, for this first part, I want you to go with me to Galatians chapter 2, verse 21. Galatians chapter 2, uh, verse 21. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. The title of today's message is Dirty Laundry. Dirty Laundry. Can I, can I have my basket? Can I have my basket? Thank you so much. Okay. This is a real dirty laundry basket from a real son mine <laughs> and I asked him keep it dirty keep it like legit dirty and it's starting off I mean we might have some underwear in here but these here here's some wow here here are swim trunks it's a towel <laughs> okay okay make sure we don't find any drug paraphernalia in here <laughs> Parker's in the back right now um 
Man, this kid's got a lot of towels here. <laughs> Dang. What in the world, boy? You don't do laundry. Look at all these towels. Okay, so, so my man Parker, he's, uh, he's 16 uh, years old. When a boy turns about 10, there's a level of funk that comes into a boy's life. <laughs> Parents, you know what I'm talking about here. Come on. It is nasty. It is your, your sweet son all of a sudden turns into, I don't know, a rhinoceros or something. It's just... It's animal kingdom, and, and you still love them, but you're like, wow, you, it's time for deodorant. It's time now for deodorant. You need to start doing that. And uh, even our 10-year-old uh, right now, he might not want me saying this, but he's got like the, he's about to turn 11. He's got, you know, the hair coming in his armpits, and I'm like, wow. And he's like, dad. I'm like, man, I don't, I don't want to see that. He's like, no, pull it, dad. Pull it. So I've done it, you know, just to be a good dad. I've just, it's just a little, it's a quick pull. <laughs> but their clothes, man, it, it, it's just, they can be, they can smell terrible. You can walk into a room at times, the boys' room, you're like, wow, 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 wow. So, so clean this up. Now, now this might be elementary, uh, but, but I think I, think I got to say it that if these clothes are dirty, they need to be cleaned. I mean, it's not, it's not rocket science for me to say dirty clothes have to be clean. It, 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 it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a hard leap for you to understand that if you keep wearing something over and over and over and over and over again, that at some point in time, you better wash those jeans. <laughs> you better wash those underwear. You better wash that t-shirt. At some point in time, that stuff has to be clean. And I, I, hey, we've all done it. We've all worn it, thrown it, picked it up again. We've all done it, okay? And maybe worn it multiple times. <laughs> we, we've all done that. You were just going to the store, didn't think you were going to see anyone. Then all of a sudden you see people and you got mustard and ketchup and all types of things on your clothes. That, that shirt just has not been, has not been cleaned yet. I want to I wanna today not talk about dirty clothes. I want to talk about dirty lives. I want to talk about lives that need to be washed. I want to talk about lives that need, need to be scrubbed. Now, in our day and age, I recognize that there are people that will disagree with me about the idea that anyone's life would need to be scrubbed because there are some in our world that would say there's no such thing as sin. There are some in our world that would say, I can live however I want to live, do whatever I want to do. There are no consequences. I am my own God. I am my own person. I recognize there are people that think that, believe that, and live that way. I recognize that. I would disagree with those people. And I think the Bible would disagree with them as well. We know dirty clothes need to be clean, but, but for the reality is when we look at the life and this world that we are living in, we can see dirt everywhere. You can see dirt in the way individuals are treating each other. You can see dirt in the way people are talking about each other behind each other's backs. You can see dirt in the way that churches are tearing each other apart. You can see dirt in the way that husbands and wives are going at each other. You can see dirt in the way that roommates are attacking each other. You can see dirt in the way that some older people are treating younger people. And you can definitely see dirt in how some younger people are treating older people. You can see dirt in how this group treats that group and how that group treats this group. You can see dirt all over the place. You can see dirt with nations fighting against nations you can see dirt everywhere you can see dirt with how people at your job are treating you and how they've ostracized you because you decided to stand up or you decided to be a person of God and how they're treating you can see dirt everywhere and in this world that we are living in there is dirt from the top to the bottom there is dirt in this church and I don't dare want any of us to walk around like I don't even know what you're talking about no we got some funky dirty nasty folks up in here and one of the biggest problems is the church people want to pretend like we don't have any dirt when we know we have dirt. And as long as we keep pretending like we don't have any dirt, then you and I think we don't need to be cleansed. But the reality is we all need a washing. 
every last one of us, me included. So now what, 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 what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Because some people, some people think, some people think when you're looking at the dirt in our lives, I, I probably need to walk around dirty for the rest of my life. Like you, like the dirt's not just on me, the dirt is me. Like the poor choices you've made, the decisions, the people that you've hurt or wronged. The times you knew you were supposed to go right, but you went left. The times you're supposed to go left, but you went right. The, the times that you knew you, you didn't want to click on that, but you clicked on it anyway. The times uh, that you sent the DM that you wish you wouldn't have sent. The time that you slept with the person that you wish you wouldn't have slept with. The time I go down the line here. I'm talking to real people here. I'm talking to real people. Real people that deal with real stuff. Real people that have real bank account problems or real emotional problems or real spiritual problems or real physical or mental problems. Individuals that are really dealing with real things. And what does God have to do with any of that stuff? Is Sunday just supposed to be a day where we kind of come feel good about ourselves? Or does the word of God have anything to say about the dirt in our lives? I think it has a lot to say with it. The reality is if there is no sin, there is no need for a savior. And if there is no disease, there's no need for a cure. But the reality is there is sin and there is disease. So today we're going to talk about something that I know is not going to sound sexy. But it's important. It's what lies beneath and we're going to talk about this thing called righteousness. Righteousness. Now, again, I didn't think I was going to get any claps on that. I didn't, think, I didn't think I was, anyone was going to be like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to hear about this. I didn't, I didn't think that. But I'm fine with that. I don't live for your applause anyway. Because I was praying and I was like, God, what do you want our church to know? And he was like, hey, Earl, you, you, got, you, you could see how quickly people moved last year. You could see how quickly people were shaken. You could see how quickly people were uprooted. You could see how quickly people stepped away from their faith. You could see how quickly people began to doubt the truth of my word. You could see how quickly individuals vacillated between what the world was saying and what my word was saying. So, Earl, I'm going to need you for a couple of weeks to get into the soil of this church family, this family that I put together because I want them to be steadfast and immovable. I want them seeing themselves the way I see them. I want them walking how I call them to walk. I want them living how I call them to live. I want them praying like I call them to pray. I want them standing like I call them to stand. I want them being who I've called them to be. And this issue of righteousness is critical to. If it's important enough for God to gift it, then it's important enough for me to understand it. If righteousness does not matter at all, then why did God give it in the first place? If righteousness is, is, a, is an inconsequential thing, then why did Jesus gift this to us? If it's, a, if it's important enough for God to give it, then it's important enough for you and I to understand it. So I want you to go with me now. I want you to go with me to Leviticus. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Leviticus. Yep. Chapter 4. This is an Old Testament book right here. This is a book that you never read. This is a book if you're tired or you can't go to sleep at night, grab Leviticus. Grab Leviticus and just start reading Leviticus. And you'll be like, <laughs> it'll knock you right out. Lord, I hope, uh, I mean, I'm just, Lord, I'm telling the truth right now. That's, Leviticus is not a book that you read. You're like, woo, I'm motivated. You read Leviticus and you're like, wow, wow. You kept this in here. So Leviticus chapter 4, verses 13 through 21. I'm going to read a number of verses here because I want to help you understand what the Old Testament did. About how God dealt with this issue of dirt and sin in the Old Testament. You got to see this. If the whole Israelite community sins unintentionally and does what is forbidden in any of the Lord's commands, even though the community is unaware of the matter. Again, this is Leviticus chapter 4, verse number 13. Um, even if they're unaware of the matter, when they realize their guilt and the sin they committed becomes known, 
The assembly must bring a young bull as a sin offering and present it before the tent of meeting. The elders of the community are to lay their hands on the bull's head before the Lord. And the bull shall be, okay, here it is, slaughtered before the Lord. It's about to get bloodier. Then the anointed priest is to take some of the bull's blood from the tent of meeting, okay? Sounds crazy. He shall dip his finger into the blood and sprinkle it before the Lord seven times in front of the curtain. He is to put some of the blood on the horns. This is bloody. Some of the blood on the horns of the altar that is before the Lord in the tent of the meeting. The rest of the blood he shall pour out at the base of the altar of burnt offering at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He shall remove all the fat from it and burn it on the altar and do with this bull just as he did with the bull for the sin offering. In this way, the priests will make atonement for the community and they will be forgiven. Then he shall take the bull outside the camp and burn it as he burnt the first bull. This is a sin offering for the community. It's in, it's in your Bible, okay? This, this is in the Bible right here. We're going to break this down for a second. This is important. This matters to your Tuesday. This matters for your marriage. This matters for your single life. This matters for your walk with God. What we're, what we're about to break down right now, this all matters for how God sees you and how you need to see yourself in light of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So in the Old Testament, somebody sins, right? So somebody messes up, messes up and they don't even know they messed up, but eventually becomes aware like, no, no, man, no, no, you messed up. Like, okay, okay, we got to do something here. And it's not like a little, nope, get a bull. Let's go. Find me a bull. Let's take this bull. You don't just pet the bull. First, they're taking this bull, bringing it to the tent of meeting, like the church, like the, the, the temple, thingy majiggy, and they, they put their hand on the bull. This represents the sin that's on the people is being transferred from them to the bull. It's going from them to the animal. It's going from them to the sacrifice. Put your hand on yourself for just for a second. Put your hand on yourself. This, 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 you're just, thank God you're not the bull. <laughs> they're, they're putting the hand. There's a whole bunch of symbolism. It's like when, when, uh, when somebody uh, gets, gets married. Uh, we got some folks about to get married uh, here in the, in the second row. Our, Na our, Nashville, our Nashville neighborhood gathering is in the house, so we love that so much. Great to see these guys. Um, when you get married and you're walking down the aisle, the, the, the bride is walking with her dad. Uh, if you, you know, had a dad, my wife's dad wasn't there to give her away, but pour it out for her homie. Uh, we love him. Uh, so her uncle gave her away. Uh, long story, long story. But anyway, uh, they walk down and, and the husband's standing there and he puts out his hand. And then, and then the dad is supposed to take the daughter's hand and he takes his daughter's hand and he puts it in, in the man's hand. And the idea here, it's he's going, she's going from the covering of her father and she's entering into a relationship, going to a covering with her husband. It's all symbolism right here. We're joining hands where now, now you and I are being unified. It's a, it's a small thing, but it, but it represents something greater. So in Leviticus chapter 4, you see them putting their hand on the bull. This is, this is letting them know the sin that's on us. We're about to get this sin off of us, and we're putting this sin on the sacrifice. It doesn't stay on us anymore. It goes on the sacrifice, and now the sacrifice has to be killed. So the sacrifice now has to shed its blood because the Bible teaches us without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. So now I've taken my sin, and I put it on. I put it on this sacrifice, and now the sacrifice can't just keep living. This sacrifice now has to die. This sacrifice has to shed its blood. And there's a priest that's involved in this whole thing. And the priest, what they do is they, they got this blood and he actually dips his finger in the blood and he walks around flicking it. 
But the Bible has, no, there's no unintentional details. There's no irrelevant details in the Bible. So now he's flicking it seven times. He's taking the blood from the sacrifice, flicking it seven times. Seven is the number of perfection and completion here in the scripture. Now one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is not a half-baked salvation. It's not a half-baked forgiveness. This is going to be complete for you because your sin was now on this bull and this animal and this animal has shed its blood and now the priest is taking this blood and he's flicking it one two three four five six seven it's going to be complete one two three four five six seven it's going to be complete one two three four five six seven it's going to be complete i'm, I'm doing a complete work here and then after that happens the animal is going to be burned the animal is going to be sacrificed and all this stuff is happening all of this is pointing to what john says in the gospel of john chapter 1 verse 29 when jesus shows up john the baptist says behold the lamb the sacrifice of god who's about to take away the sin of the world he lets us know that jesus is actually the one that's being talked about in leviticus so over and over and over in the old testament they're doing this sacrifice they don't know that they're actually pointing to a greater sacrifice someone is going to come one day and he is going to be both the sacrifice and the priest his name is jesus and he is going to shed his blood and our sins are going to be taken off of us and they will be put on him and it's going to be a complete work it'll be a one two three four five six seven it will be a complete work So now what, what happens, what happens is many, many in the church, we try to clean ourselves, not understanding that someone else paid the price for us. See, the Old Testament, the Old Testament is fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. And again, he is as Hebrews, you can want to read a great book of the Bible, read the book of Hebrews. He is our priest and he's our sacrifice. And what was on you was put on him. When you unintentionally sin, it was put on him. And when you intentionally sin, come on, you know when you're like, I didn't know it was going to end up there. Wait, 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 you texted at, at 1.15 a.m., you went over there at 2.15 a.m., and you brought in wine? Why are y'all getting quiet on me now? You're like, what? <laughs> uh, no, no, I just wanted to talk. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we all like to talk. <laughs> okay so now now when you and i purposefully or even unintentionally miss the mark we have to understand that there's someone that's done a complete work for us but how do you access this we access righteousness by belief not behavior we access righteousness by belief not behavior we access righteousness by belief, not behavior. Let me read this scripture to you here. Uh, stick with me. Stick with me. It's in, it's in Romans chapter 4, verse number 3. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. I got another verse for you. Romans chapter 3, verse 22. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who, what's the word? Believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. This is letting us know that you do not get right standing with God by your behavior. I got to break this, y'all. Because too many of us are living a lie and you're living with guilt you're not supposed to be living with because you think your righteousness is gained by you living right. You living right is a response to the righteousness that you already have in Jesus. 
I gotta flip this. This is what some of y'all are like. What? Oh, wait, oh, wait, wait. You're telling me my behavior. You're telling me I don't earn this. I'm telling you, you cannot earn what Jesus Christ gave you. Your behavior is not the thing that makes you right with God. It is Christ's behavior that makes you right with God. And you and I access our new life. We access this righteousness not by works. It is not by you giving your money. It is not by you giving your time. It is not by you being nice to little old ladies. It is not by you being nice to your neighbor. It, you do not get your righteousness by doing any other activity other than believing that what Jesus Christ did for you was enough. That is how you and I access this this righteousness, it is given as a gift. So I want you, I want you now, I want you to say these, these three phrases with me. Say, say, I'm clean. Say, I'm approved. Say, I'm in right standing. Say, I'm clean. Say, I'm approved. I'm in right standing. Say, I'm clean. I'm approved. I'm in right standing. These clothes right here, these clothes right here, they don't clean themselves. What we have to do is we usually stick them in a washing machine. And when you put them in this other thing, this thing that they are in actually washes them. I want you to understand that you and I are the dirty clothes and we are put in Christ. And when that door is closed, he cleanses us and you and I come out different. Not because of what we did, we just got tossed around in him. So next time you go wash your clothes, I want you to remind yourself that this is you. I want you to see yourself being put in Jesus. And when you are put in him, it is his blood and his sacrifice and his work and his power and his life and his mind and his body and his blood. It's all of that that has washed you and made you whole. That's why you can be worn now. That's why you can be used by God now. Not because you cleaned yourself up, but it's because you were put in Jesus. I'm clean. I'm approved. Anybody want to buy a home? Anybody want to buy a home? Anybody interested in buying a home? I know we got some folks here want to buy. Well, this market is crazy in Dallas. I don't know how it is in other parts of the, of the country, but it's crazy right now in Dallas. I mean, you got one house and you got 38 people, you know, putting an uh, offer on that house. People writing all kinds of crazy letters like, hey, I need this home. I love you so much. Here's my family Get, sending pictures of a family that doesn't even look like you just so you can hopefully they'll pick you. <laughs> But whenever you're buying a home, y'all know this, you got you to get a lot of stuff in order. You got to get a lot of stuff in order. You got to get a lot of money in order. You got to cross a lot of T's. You got to dot, dot a lot of I's. You got to get a lot of stuff in order. And you got to go to that broker and you got to give them your life. You're giving them, here are my pay stubs. Here's my W-2. Oh, here's this. Oh, I was self-employed. Oh, I lost my job for that period of time. Oh, you got to write a letter about this. You got to write a letter about that. Hey, how much you want? You, got, you have to put down. Because it was, it was a day back in the day you didn't have to put any money down. Okay? And then y'all jacked that up. So now we all got to put money in and you got put down 3%, you got to put down 5%, you got to put down 20%, you got to put down maybe even more percent. I was looking for a house in Turks and Caicos, not because I can't afford one, but I want to go there one day. And they told me I got to put 60% down and I acted like I, I was like, oh, okay, cool, 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 cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you 60, not 70? Okay, yeah, okay, okay, fine, fine, fine. I'll, 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 I'll reach out to you, I'll reach out to you. <laughs> I ain't getting approved for that house, I'll just you know that right now. <laughs> But you gotta have you gotta have the you gotta have a certain amount of money. You gotta you gotta have the credit history. You gotta have the credit score in order to be approved. And and there's just all oh, this wonderful moment where you get that pre-approval letter. But pre-approval is just kind of like a little bit of a fake thing because that's like they didn't really like do the deep dive yet. Like oh yeah okay sure. And then when it's time to actually get that house, I mean you are giving blood. It seems like you're letting these folks know everything that you've done the last seven years. You're writing a letter to explain this one thing. Like well Sally Mae, I, I moved and then I didn't see that she sent me the bill, and so that's why. And so you're, you're trying to let people know all this business. But there's a day that comes you are cleared to close. It says you are approved. It says all of this stuff that you have in the bank, all this stuff from the past has approved you to be able to get this next thing. I. Know 
need you to understand that that is what God, when he looks at you, he sees you as fully approved. That Jesus is your W-2. Jesus is your money in the bank. His sacrifice was enough to make sure your credit history and all of your work history is enough for you to get this next thing. Your righteousness comes by his work. Now, 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 I'm in right standing. I'm in right standing. This is important, okay, because I'm clean. I'm approved. I'm in right standing. My wife, the, the cops were after her. I'm not lying. I think I told some of y'all this story one time. There was a warrant out for her arrest. Onika was, she's a thug, y'all, back in the day. She was a thug. <laughs> cops showed up to our house. This is a true story. Cops showed up to our house, knocked on the door. I opened the door. There's, there's a police officer standing. I'm like, yes, yes, sir. Yes, police officer. Uh, he goes, um, is Onika McClellan here? Uh, yes, yes, she, yes, she's here. Well, there's a warrant out for her arrest. <laughs> Who did I marry? <laughs> he says, uh, yeah, there's a warrant out for arrest for a speeding ticket. I was like, oh, I was supposed to pay that for her. <laughs> True story. I'm like, sir. She's breastfeeding right now. We just had our son, okay? We just had, we just had Parker, and Onika was in the room. I mean, Parker, he's a week old. He's a week old, and the cops, the popo, are at the house. And, and I'm like, no, sir. He's like, well, I don't want to arrest her. Can, it's $228 or something like that. Can you, can you just pay it now? And this is before they got like, you know, it's, there's no card to swipe. There's no like Apple Pay. I'm like, can I Zelle? There's no Zelle. There's none of that stuff at all. I'm like writing a check. And he's like, I don't take checks. I'm like, well, you take hugs? What, 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 what I need to do here, man? Because you can't take my wife to prison, okay? I can't breastfeed. My wife is the only one that can feed our child. <laughs> This all has to do with righteousness. So, <laughs> so I pay the bill. I pay, I, I pay it and I have to call on the phone. I pay the bill. He goes, okay, sir. Okay, now, now she's in right standing. Because the bill was paid. So now she doesn't get arrested. Now her record is expunged. <laughs> now she can pass a background check because... It was paid. Put my picture of my steak. Me eating my steak on the screen real quick. Put my picture of my, me eating my steak. <laughs> Woo! I ate the steak at Monarch Restaurant in Dallas. Y'all, this steak, can I, tell, can I tell how much it cost? Can I tell how much it cost? This steak is $185. I'm sitting at a table with some friends and I like steak. And they're like, you need to get that. And I'm like, I'm trying to get a house in Turks. I can't. I can't get this steak. They're like, no, get it, get it, get it, get it. And some, I don't even remember saying yes. But somehow this steak ends up in front of me, y'all. I have never in my, never, never in my life has a steak talked to me like this steak talked to me. Come here, boy. You bring those thick lips over here. And you slice into me and I want you to enjoy every bit of me. That's what this steak was saying to me. That was very weird. Uh, <laughs> that joke's not making it to second service. I can tell you that right now. My wife's going to X that one out. <laughs> I cut into that thing. Oh, look at my face. You can see me. You can see me. I'm like... <sighs> I received... I, I actually... I ended up not paying for this steak. Somebody I was with at the table paid for it. So now I received what someone else prepared and what someone else paid for. I'm now just enjoying 
what someone else prepared and what someone else paid for. And I, that can lead me to guilt or it can lead me to gratitude. So instead of it leading me to guilt, I had to say, God, thank you so much that somebody else prepared this and somebody else paid for this. And I'm telling you, this is what happened with your righteousness. You are now clean, approved, and in right standing, not because of what you prepared and what you pray, paid for, but because of what somebody else prepared and what somebody else paid for. My last verse, and I'm all done here, and I can get these dirty clothes out of here. Parker's cleaning these when he gets home. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Yeah, you can clap your hands for that for sure. God made him who had no sin, that's Jesus, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. North, a neighborhood gathering, White Rock Campus, Antigua, wherever you are around the world. I need you to understand that what lies beneath for you as a follower of Jesus is not you earning your way to God. And it's not you being unclean. It is not you being unapproved, to make up a word. It is not you being in wrong standing with God. So when the Bible says things like the effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man or woman are powerful, the Bible's not talking about the preacher. He's not just talking about your pastor. He's talking about every single one who has had their sins transferred from, their, from themselves and put on the sacrifice. And every single one that has received the complete work of Jesus, that is you. That's why you stand with your head held high. That's why you don't walk around guilty. That's why you don't walk around in shame. That's why you don't keep on recounting the sins of when you were 17 or 27 or 37. That's why you don't allow what others have done to you to be the thing that dictate who you are and establish your worth and value because what Jesus Christ did for you is he prepared and he paid for everything that makes you righteous. There was an exchange that happened on the cross. And it was your sin and my sin for his righteousness. And now you and I are clean. Say, I'm clean. You and I are approved. Say, I'm approved. And you and I are now in right standing with God. Say, I'm in right standing. That is who you are in Jesus Christ. And it is good news for every single one of us. If you wouldn't mind, friends and family, north, at a home, in this room, bow your head for just a moment. If you're under the sound of my voice and you've never given your heart and your life to Christ, you never made him first, you never made him number one, you've never made him the boss of your life, you have never had this great exchange. You have never received by faith, not by works, but by faith, but by believing what Jesus Christ has done for you. And if that's you, whether you're north, online, whether you're in this room, wherever you are, I want you to do something simple but something bold. On the count of three, you've never given your heart to Christ or at one point in time you did and you slipped away and today you're ready to give your heart and your life to him for the first time or rededicate your life to serving him. On the count of three, I just want you to throw your hand in the air and say, yes, that's me. Ready? One, two, three. Just put your hand in the air just saying, yes, that's me. I want to give my heart. I want to give my life to Christ. we got friends right now saying, yes, I don't want to go my own way anymore. I want to go his way. Just lift your hand high. You're saying, yes, that's me. I want to give my heart. I want to give my life to Jesus I'm gonna ask everyone to do me a favor put your hand over your heart if you would not mind and I want you to repeat this prayer out loud after me say dear Jesus I ask you to forgive me of all my sins I admit 
I've made mistakes and today I give you my heart I give you my life give me the power to live for you in Jesus name amen and amen can you lift our heads clap our hands Amen, amen, and amen. What an incredible morning. So, so good. Mm. Hey, if you just made Jesus first in your life, we want to know about yes. it. We want to hear from you. So make sure to text 97,000 Jesus first. Yes. So we want to know. We want to be praying and celebrating. Y'all, you might be thinking, well, what are my next steps? Your next step is Growth Track, yes. and we have it every single Wednesday at 8 p.m. All the information is online. We want to see you there. We want to be in your lives. Yes, yeah, so good. And we are also a generous church with a mission to make it on earth as it is in heaven. Yeah. And there are so many ways to give. Check out the screen for more info. And we hope you have an incredible day and a great rest of your week. We love you, family. See you soon.